They are the link that binds together the succession of events and realities is a golden thread of pure consciousness. The link of ignorance is, one may say, the iron link and is open to rust and decay inevitably. It is the link that binds together the ordinary life of ignorance that pulls always backward, clings to all that has gone by, seeks to extend the past into the present and the future, feels unhappy if that is disturbed. In a new and higher life, we are asked to discard that link, come out of it, to discover the other inner link, the link of light, that turns always to the future, directs all impulses and activities towards the realities that are to be. These are then the two chains binding each in its own way our life movements, each building a whole with a special significance and fulfillment. They are two lifelines, as it were, running parallel to each other. One, as I have said, is the normal mundane life, the other a transfigured spiritual life. Dupanishad, we know, speaks of the path of the Son and the path of the Fathers. They roughly correspond to the two lines I have just spoken of. But the Upanishadic path of the Son is a vertical ascension from the normal lifeline into a transcendent beyond. What we meant was not an ascension beyond, but a parallel growth in transformation. That is to say, what we refer to as the lower iron links are to be transmuted into the golden ones, not breaking or dissolving them. The problem is to find out the secret of this alchemy that transmutes the iron links into the golden ones. Psychologically, the Buddhist way is a great help, even if it is not the unique an inevitable one towards that consummation. For it dislocates, disintegrates the chain that binds the being to the normal and ignorant life. It teaches one to see and feel life as separate and isolated moments. There being no real link between the moments, so if one is to live the truth of life, one must learn to live from moment to moment without any thought from the past or of the future. The biblical motto gains in this connection a deeper significance sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. One does not carry on his shoulders the burden of the past moments nor a possible burden in the thought of the future. One becomes free, absolutely free, with no care, but it is just the need of the moment to note and the immediate gesture to meet it. That is a way, an effective way for dissolving life. But we seek, as we said, not dissolution or disintegration, but integration. Integration into a higher integer, a greater reality. The lower chain dissolved, we have to find a new status beyond the dissolution. That is perhaps what the Upanishad indicated when it said, one has to traverse death 
through ignorance, perception of ignorance, and then through knowledge, perception of the knowledge, attain immortality. Buddha has led us across death. Now we have to reach immortality. There is a higher line of karma and a lower line running parallel, as I said, to each other. The lower the iron chain leads from death to death, the higher the golden one leads from life to life and from light to light. The transference from the lower chain to the higher is to be affected by the consciousness of nothingness, shunyam, being filled or impregnated with the new consciousness of immortality. For the units of the normal or ignorant consciousness are themselves not wholly or essentially ignorant and mortal. They have in them what Buddha did not see or recognize, the immortal soul or self. As the Vedic Rishi said, that which is immortal in the mortal. What is mortal in the apparently mortal unit is the covering that hides the mortal nucleus. This covering is made of, as we know, the mental, the vital, and the physical being. These perish, that is to say, change, but that does not affect the mortal being within. Thus the consciousness is to be drawn away or detached from the covering and hitched on to the unchanging reality within. That forms the golden link of the chain of immortality of the Supreme Light. The transference from the lower chain is to be effected through the consciousness of the luminous, immortal, divine unit. It is the divine in man, familiarly called Antaryamin. Naturally, the transference of the consciousness and being from the lower or surface line to the line that lies on a higher and deeper level does not mean we must note the rejection or annihilation of the lower in favor of the higher. The consciousness of the soul or self does not negate the consciousness of the body and the life and the mind. It only purifies, elevates, and transmutes them into its true and divine expression and embodiment. To live in the soul is to live in eternity with the vision and inspiration of the eternal. It is living in the mind and the vital and the body that turns and binds one to the past, renders one a slave to mortality. The units of this higher chain of consciousness are free from all drag of the past or hold of the present. Their being is turned automatically towards the future, the great event to which all creation moves, for that is the truth of its inmost reality. The inspiration of its movements comes from that intimate source. The units of one's own life, all its movements, share in this freedom and this life inspiration, and all together form the wonderful harmony of the golden chain. The units are not separated or isolated from each other, 
freedom of the individual here does not mean isolation it is a close union indeed it is an indivisible unity for all units all individual formations are identical for in essence all are identified with the only reality the one supreme consciousness the soul consciousness is the golden thread running through the chain of light and when it comes forward and becomes dynamic it gradually engulfs and purifies what was its covering the life the mind and the body and it reforms them in its own light and energy expressing and embodying its divine truth and fulfillment here below a bit of savitri last time we met here i read out to you from savitri a description of hell a hell that the world is its true nature and its implications today i will read out to you a little more of it for it is that we are now passing through mankind and the world and we have to pass through it because through it lies the path to the heavens which we are destined to reach inevitably in the end in the meanwhile the journey has to be undertaken and it is such a hopeless track for here must the traveler of the upward way for daring hell's kingdom winds the heavenly road pause or pass slowly through that perilous space the prayer upon his lips and the great name a race possessed inhabited those paths a force demoniac lurking in man's depths that heaves suppressed by the heart's human law ordered by the calm and sovereign eyes of thought can in a fire and earthquake of the soul arise and calling to its native night overthrow the reason occupy the life and stamp its hoof on nature's shaking ground this was for them their beings flaming core a mighty energy a monster god hard to the strong implacable to the weak it stared at the harsh unpitying world it made with the stony eyelids of its fixed idea its heart was drunk with a dire hunger so in in other suffering felt a thrill delight and of death and ruin the grandiose music heard to have power to be master was soul virtue and good 
It claimed the whole world for evil's living room. Its party's grim totalitarian reign, the cruel destiny of breathing things. All on one plan was shaped and standardized under a dark dictatorship's breathless weight. In street and house, in councils and in courts, beings he met who looked like living men and climbed in speech upon high wings of thought, but harbored all that is subhuman, vile, and lower than the lowest reptiles crawl. The reason meant for nearness to the gods, an uplift to heavenly scale by the touch of mind, only enhanced by its enlightening ray, their inborn nature's wry monstrosity, often a familiar visage, studying joyfully, encountered at some dangerous turn, hoping to recognize a look of light, his vision, warned by the spirit's inward eye, discovered suddenly hell's trademark there, or saw with the inner sense that cannot err, in the semblance of a fair and virile form, the demon and the goblin and the ghoul. An insolence reigned of cold, stone-hearted strength, mighty, obeyed, approved by the titan's law. The huge laughter of a giant cruelty and fierce, glad deeds of ogre violence. In that wide, cynic den of thinking beasts, one looked in vain for a trace of pity and love. There was no touch of sweetness anywhere, but only force and its acolytes, greed and hate. There was no help for suffering, none to save, none dared to resist or speak a noble word. Armed with the ages of tyrannic power, signing the edicts of a dreadful rule, and using blood and torture as a seal, darkness proclaimed her slogans the world. A servile, blinkered silence hushed the mind, or only it repeated lessons taught, while mitter, holding the good shepherd's staff, falsehood enthroned on awed and prostrate hearts the cults and creeds that organize a living death and slay the soul on the altar of a lie. All were deceived, or served their own deceit. Truth in that stifling atmosphere could not live. Their wretchedness believed in its own joy, and fear and weakness hugged their abject depths. All that is low and sordid thoughted, base, all that is drab and poor and miserable, breathed in a laxed content its natural air, and felt no yearning of divine release. Arrogant, jiving at more luminous states, the people of the gulfs despised the sun, a barriered autarchy excluded light, fixed in its will to be its own gray self, 
it vaunted its norm, unique and splendid type. It soothed its hunger with its plunderous dream, flaunting its cross of servitude like a crown. It clung to its dismal, harsh autonomy. A bull thought bellowed with its brazen tongue, its hard and shameless clamor filling space and threatening all who dared to listen to truth, claimed the monopoly of the battered ear. A deafened acquiescence gave its vote, and daggered dogmas shouted in the night, kept for the fallen soul once deemed a god, deprived of its abysmal absolute. A lone discoverer in these menacing realms, guarded like termite cities from the sun, Oppressed meet crowd and tramp and noise and flare, passing from dusk to deeper dangerous dusk, he wrestled with powers that snatched from mind its light and smote from him their clinging influences. The questioner asked, Is there a fixed number of souls? Can they be counted? The speaker answered, Yes, they are limited and they can be counted. With great curiosity and eagerness, the questioner asked, How many? How many? Quietly, the one who was speaking extended her hand and put out one single index finger and said one. So that is the truth. All these many bodies, many persons you see, it is all one appearance. There is only one soul and everyone is that. If you realize this truth, you can love everyone equally, not merely love, but be one with all, because you are all and all are you. That universal self, your own true self, you have to find, you have to know, you have to become. That is the golden rule as the ideal. How to attain, how to realize it, the mother in this matter has given us a golden rule, a truly golden rule and very simple. Generally, we are confused as to our duty, what to do, what not to do, how to do, how not to do. The mother says to the children, do not do what you will hesitate to do or be ashamed of doing in my presence. Do not say anything which you will hesitate to say or be ashamed of saying in my presence. Do not think even 
what you will find it awkward to think in my presence. Well, try this way and you will find what a golden rule and a simple rule it is. Sri Aurobindo confirms and says the same thing. He says, you will know the well-known phrase, always behave as if the mother was looking at you because she is indeed always present. You need not imagine that she is there, for she is actually always there, whether you imagine or not. You do not know, for you are blind, but she is always there, seeing you, observing you, guiding you, protecting you. She not only sees what you do, but even what you feel inside you, even your most secret thoughts. A child once asked the mother in its simplicity, how do you know, mother, what we do, what we think, what we feel? How do you know it? The mother smiled and answered, my child, because you are within me, within my embrace always, therefore I know. I know what is happening in me, don't I? That is why I see what is happening in you. You are not outside me, you are part of myself, I am you. Now, if you follow this simple rule sincerely and persistently, you will see this change miraculously happening in you. You will become the golden child of the golden mother. You will find your thoughts, your words, your feelings, your impulses putting on a new color. Even your body will take a new glow of health and beauty. Normally, our brain is made of mud. Our thoughts are unclean. We have wrong thoughts, dark thoughts. Our tongue also is made of mud or clay. We speak wrong things, impure things. Our heart too is made of the same substance, giving out wrong feelings and unclean feelings. Lower down in our nature, in the vital region, our impulsions are also wrong and muddy and unclean. Finally, the body is mud itself. It is made of diseases and weaknesses and incapable of anything. We are, as it were, a container containing this ugly and unclean mixture. What we have to do is to pour into it the golden liquid, molten gold that will wash away all that impurity and filth. Clean the vessel and fill it with its own radiant substance, the molten gold which is the mother's presence. This process has been beautifully described by Sri Aurobindo in one of his poems, I conclude by reading out those magnificent lines, perhaps you all know. The golden light, thy golden light came down into my brain and the grey rooms of mind sun just became a bright reply to wisdom's occult plane, a calm illumination 
and the flame. Thy golden light came down into my throat, and all my speech is now a tune divine, a pian song of thee, my single note. My words are drunk with the immortal swine. Thy golden light came down into my heart, smiting my life with thy eternity. Now has it grown a temple where thou art, and all its passions point towards only thee. Thy golden light came down into my feet. My earth is now thy playfield and thy seat. Usually after a talk, you expect from me something of Savitri. That was our custom. So here is something on Savitri. Savitri, the human divine, the passing of Satyavan. This was the day when Satyavan must die. The day is come, the fateful day, the last day of the twelve happy months that they have passed together. She knew it, it was foretold, it was foreseen, and she was preparing herself for it all the while harboring a pain deep-seated within the heart, revealed to none, not even to her mother, not even to Satyavan. Satyavan was innocent like a child, oblivious of the fate that was coming upon him. The two went out of the hermitage into the forest, for she wished to move about in the company of Satyavan, in the midst of the happy greeneries where Satyavan had passed his boyhood, his youth. She was watching Satyavan at every step. She did not want to be caught unawares. Love in her bosom, heart at the jagged edges of anguish, moaned at every step with pain, crying, Now, now perhaps his voice will cease forever. She was on tiptoe, as it were, almost breathless. The end must be coming on fast. Her life was now in seconds, not in hours, and every moment she economized. Satyavan in playfulness was cutting the branch of a tree with a joyous axe and on his lips high snatches of a sage's chant that peeled of conquered death and demons slain. All of a sudden the doom came upon him. He felt a biting pain through his body and an invading suffocation besieged him. He threw away the axe and cried out to Savitri. Savitri, a pang cleaves through my head and breast. Such agony rends me. A while, let me lay my head upon thy lap. Savitri saw the end coming and she was ready. All grief and fear were dead within her now. 
and a great calm had fallen. His life was ebbing away, and he cried out in a clinging last despair, Savitri, Savitri, oh Savitri, lean down my soul and kiss me while I die. His cheek pressed down her golden arms. She caught his mouth still with her living mouth as if she could persuade his soul back with her kiss. Then grew aware they were no more alone. Something had come there, conscious, vast, and cream. Near her she felt a silent shade immune. Death is come claiming his prey. Satyavan must go and leave his Savitri. The interzone. Death is carrying away Satyavan, the luminous soul of Satyavan. The great shadow is leading the way. Satyavan following and Savitri clinging to his steps. Death saw Savitri pursuing. He turned and tried to dissuade her from the pursuit. Savitri refused to turn back. Death warned her. It was already a wrong and anomalous act that she has done to have crossed over to his sphere in her earthly personal being. It is time now to go back. Savitri answered that she would go back only with Satyavan in his earthly body. Death became impatient and answered, do you ask for the impossible? You want to go back to earth for earthly happiness. You can have that in plenty without Satyavan. Satyavan has passed beyond and there is no return for him. But Savitri was firm in her resolution. I claim back Satyavan as he was my happiness is with him alone. As they proceeded, they mounted higher and higher regions of being, and a change was coming on visibly on Savitri. Death was explaining to her that happiness on earth or in earthly life is not the supremely desirable thing. The supreme desirable thing is to discard the maya of earthly life, that veil of tears, and rise into the very source, the origin of creation, the infinite peace and silence. As death was receding towards that ultimate nothingness, the divinity that Savitri was, the mighty Godhead that took a human shape manifested itself more and more, shedding all around her a great effulgence, a mighty power. She had entered into death's own lair and identified herself with death's self, which is the divine himself. In that great burning light, death was consumed and dissolved. The dire universal shadow disappeared 
vanishing into the void from which it came. And the Satyavan and Savitri were alone. They stand face to face with the Supreme Divine alone. There is yet a last choice to make. Death has been annihilated and immortality attained. One can rest there and enjoy immortality eternally beyond the mortal creation. But there is a greater destiny for the human soul. Ignorance is darkness indeed, but to enter into light alone is to enter into a greater darkness. And Savitri has attained the immortality as a human being, as a human personality. She is to bring down that immortality into the human creature upon earth. She refuses the everlasting day and turns to come down again into the twilight mortality with all her immortal stature so that human beings may be rebuilt in that mold. So they come down, Satyavan and Savitri, from the supreme heavens, rushing down as heavens a blessing, as it were through ethereal atmospheres, gradually reassuming the texture of earthly form, till they found their material body again upon this concrete earth. A power leaned down, a happiness found its home over wide earth brooded the infinite bliss. The return. Satyavan lay on the green sward. Over him and around green branches spread their peaceful felicity. His head reposed upon the lap of Savitri. Exactly as he lay at the last fateful hour confronting the mighty shadow as if there was no gap or hiatus in between the great intervening experience was only just a momentary dream not the ageless Calvary it seemed to be in the other sphere. But now the waking gladness of our members felt the weight of heaven in his limbs and all her life was conscious of his life. Human she was once more earth Savitri yet felt in her illimitable change. Satyavan's being was there, pure, passionate to the passion of the gods. Desire stirred not the wings, for all was made an overarching of celestial rays, like the absolved control of sky on plain. Heavens leaning down to embrace from all sides earth. Satyavan now turned to Savitri. Vague recollections rose in him and he cried out in wonder. Whence hast thou 
brought me captive back. Love came to thee, and sunlight's walls, O oh golden beam. And uh, casket of all sweetness, savitri, godhead and woman, moonlight of my soul. As he gazed upon her, his wonder grew more and more, with a new flame of worship in his eyes, and he exclaimed once more, What high change is in thee, O Savitri, bright ever thou wast, a goddess still and pure, yet dearer to me by thy sweet human parts, earth gave thee, making thee yet more divine. The embodied divine does not discard thee, or even minimize the human. On the contrary, greatens and heightens this earthly being. It is a sea chain that is wrought in the content and in a certain modality of the form, but the essential form and content remain somewhat like the process of fossilization. Mortality is squeezed out and all is molded in immortality. The divinity is there in all its fullness, but there is added to it the exquisiteness that earth brings to the human. And Savitri says, we have borne identity with the Supreme and known His meaning in our mortal lives. Yet nothing is lost of mortal love's delight. Heaven's touch fulfills but cancels not our earth. Still am I she who came to thee mid the murmur of sunlit leaves upon the forest verge. I am the Madran, I am Savitri. Thus is human as human can be, the quintessence of humanity, for it is human divinely.